the first tip that I always give people when they ask me, um, you know, how I capture some of these uh, pictures is to study the subject. Um, studying the subject doesn't mean that you need to become a professional entomologist or anything like that. It just means that you need to sit and observe uh, what's going on. Um, I spent a lot of time, uh, particularly with the in-flight insects, that's really, really challenging to do. And I spent a lot of time chasing them as they were flying really fast and uh, ultimately realized that there were better opportunities uh, to catch them when they would be moving a little bit more slowly or they'd be hovering in place. And so um, learning to watch for those moments, um, it really made me realize that that's the most important thing. It's, you do need to improve your skills, but no matter how skillful you are, you're never going to catch a bee that's zipping by you really fast. You got to learn to when they're going to slow down a little bit and give you uh, a better fighting chance of, of capturing them. So um, time of day can have an impact on that. Um, in, in the morning, they tend to move a little bit more slowly um, as well in the evening when they're starting to settle down uh, for the night, especially if you're in a place where it's a little bit cooler in the morning or in the evening, uh, they do tend to uh, settle in a little bit more and become very, uh, uh, they, they move uh, less quickly. So it's a little bit easier to get them like that. This shot here of a, a dragonfly was captured in the morning. And those are actually dew drops uh, on the uh, dragonfly. As Jim was mentioning, I don't uh, modify anything. Um, I, I try to capture insects in the wild just the way that they are. I don't even uh, use baits to attract them. I don't put um, sugar water or anything like that. I guess the one exception would be my wife does have uh, hummingbird feeders in the garden. And so those do attract hummingbirds. But I don't deliberately put uh, drops of syrup or sugar water or anything like that on, on flowers. Um, I just, I try to uh, capture them where they are and, and look for, for moments that, that look exciting to me. And so, like I said, in the morning, uh, especially if it's been a pretty cool night uh, and, and humid, uh, you'll find them just covered in dew drops first thing in the morning. And so it can make for some really cool shots when you do that. Um, this one here, this is a uh, one of my fav personal favorite in-flight shots. Uh, it's a uh, queen butterfly. I uh, captioned this one, Her Majesty. Uh, and it's a queen butterfly in flight, aiming right at the, the camera. And people, uh, you know, were pretty blown. I was pretty blown away uh, to see those details and close up like that, uh, face, facing right at the camera. And people would ask, you know, how in the world did you do that? Well, this one is an example of my second point there of mating behaviors. Uh, this is actually a male and it was dancing behind a female. So it was, it wasn't hovering, you know, holding still, but it was kind of staying in one general area. And so that allowed me to uh, line myself up um, right in front of, of the pair and just kind of wait for him to pop up into my zone and I was able to uh, lock focus and uh, capture the shot there. I actually got uh, several shots of it um, from slightly different angles as well, uh, just because of that opportunity. So watching for them mating uh, can help you to um, slow down their, their speedy movements a little bit. Um, patrolling a territory, that's how I captured this bee right here. Um, it was uh, guarding, I assume it was guarding a nest um, it was just kind of hovering back and forth in a line uh, about three feet wide, and it would turn and, and chase off anything that kind of flew uh, within the area there. But then it would always kind of come back to one general area. And so I just lined myself up again there. And um, by paying attention to what it was doing, as opposed to just kind of uh, randomly walking around and hoping something would happen, I was able to uh, capture this shot and, uh, and really, really get a pretty cool moment here. Um, there's another example of uh, mating behavior. Uh, and this is actually, a, this is a more rare moment uh, to catch a, a couple of dragonflies in flight mating, uh, what they call the mating wheel. Um, they because obviously they're not mating all the time and and uh, they're not always going to be mating up uh, close to you. So uh, cap the opportunities are a little bit less. But if you do happen to be 
if you do happen to see this and catch this opportunity, uh, it's actually a pretty good time to catch them in flight because they move at about half uh, to a quarter of their normal speed when they're hooking up. And, uh, and then just, they'll just fly kind of around the perimeter of the pond like this for maybe 30 seconds to a minute, sometimes even uh, longer, just depending on the, on the species. Um, and so these can make some good opportunities to capture them in flight. Also with dragonflies, you'll see them uh, when they're guarding a territory, like I had mentioned, or if they're, uh, if they spot a female, they'll typically hover behind her for a second. Uh, and if you're paying attention and, and catch that at the right time and, and within a good distance of it, uh, you can catch them like that. Uh, visiting popular flowers. Um, this is uh, a carpenter bee, male carpenter bee on a uh, golden ground cell. And this is a good example, not only of uh, visiting a popular flower, but also time of day and time of year, um, because this was uh, taken around February. Uh, so it was still pretty cold, even here in Houston. Um, but golden ground cell is one of the first flowers to start blooming in, in the spring, um, typically around January, February, uh, late January, uh, early February is when they'll start blooming here. And so that creates an opportunity of where you can go look for them. And then because it is pretty cool, this was uh, probably in the uh, upper 50s, uh, low 60s that morning. So it was moving pretty slow. Um, it was definitely alive and uh, feeding on that flower. I got a number of shots from a couple of different angles, but it was crawling around on the flower versus flying to one and then zipping off and flying to the next one. So if you're wanting up close macro, um, and not uh, just close up photography from a distance. Um, there's is two different styles that I do. If you want the up close, you need to find them when they're um, moving a little bit more slowly or even resting. Um, another thing that you'll see them do, particularly with, uh, with dragonflies and damselflies is that they'll uh, set up a perch. And then like, as you approach, they, they're very sensitive to your movements. They have um, additional eyes in, in addition to having amazing compound eyes on the, you know, the really large ones that are obvious there in the center of their head, uh, they have some additional eyes called ocelli. And so, and those uh, are, they're simpler eyes, but all that they do is kind of sense movement. And so they're really good at, at detecting movement. So you have to move really slow, but uh, uh, typically if you, if they fly off, and you just stop and wait there for a second, they'll come back to that perch. And so you just wait there, inch in a little bit more closely. And then uh, usually once you're within a foot of them, you can kind of move around without uh, them panicking and they'll, they'll pretty much just stay there for you and let you uh, get as many pictures as you want of them. Um, let's see here, approaching a nest. This is uh, how I was able to capture this. And this was actually really cool. This was one of my first shots uh, that I captured um, using um, the, the Nisi close-up lens and a uh, diffused flash. So I was really, really close to this one. I was probably, it was maybe six inches uh, from the front of the camera. And what I did, this is a sand wasp. And so they are solitary wasps that dig holes in the sand, in, in, in the ground, in sandy soil. and uh, so I, I noticed where it had, was making a nest and it would um, bring back provisions and get down into the nest and then fly out. And so I just sat there and waited for it to come back with my camera lined up and uh, it, it hovers down. It doesn't just drop right into, the, into its hole. It kind of hovers down slowly and I was able to uh, capture that shot. So that's another opportunity. It's still, I don't want to give you the impression that that makes it easy, but it makes it possible. And so it takes a lot, it still takes a lot of practice and I'll go a lot more into the specific techniques uh, later on, as far as like your camera settings and things like that. But uh, for now, I really just want to give you an overview of, of some of these uh, uh, things that you need to be aware of with the, with the insects in order to capture them. Um, here's uh, an example of a, this was one of the hardest spot, uh, dragonflies for me to capture. I, it was this year that I finally captured this one. And so this was the end of my third season as uh, doing macro photography. And uh, this, uh, this species is very uh, skittish, very elusive. 
I had never been able to get within, honestly, maybe eight to 10 feet of it. So obviously never able to get a good macro shot of it. And I tried a different approach this uh, season, which was instead of approaching walking, standing up because they stand on really tall grasses or tall dead twigs, um, maybe about two, three feet off the ground. Um, but what I did was I approached by getting down on my knees and crawling slowly to it like that. And so being willing to kind of do some of those things um, can, can make a difference. It made all the difference for this one. It, it allowed me to approach, I was still moving slowly, but I was able to get right up on top of it and then just take a couple dozen pictures, um, which I do recommend that you do. And like I said, I'll get more into that later that you take a, a lot of pictures. Uh, the second tip that I like to give people is to study the scene, to don't just uh, think about the subject um, you want to make sure that the entire composition is something, um, something beautiful, uh, to look at. And so I always tell people to look through the viewfinder, um, and ask yourself if the scene excites you. And if it doesn't try changing your point of view, uh, look for things like leading, uh, lines, look for the way that the light is hitting the subject. Um, look for things like a clean or a complimentary background. Um, depth of field. Do you want lots of depth of field or a shallow depth of field? I tend to like a really shallow depth of field so that you get a nice bokeh in the background. Um, I, I'm basically doing portraits of, of insects is the way that I like to look at it. And so I like to really separate them from the background. And so having a, a clean um, background versus a cluttered background can really make your image stand out. Um, and, and then you're also able to uh, select where to, uh, where to pre-focus, uh, particularly if you're trying to uh, capture an insect in flight. Uh, I, if I know that the, the insect is about three to four feet away from me uh, or the flowers that it's gonna be uh, on are about three to four feet away from me, I'll pre-focus on a flower or pre-focus on something that's uh, that distance away from me so that the camera can uh, catch it a little bit faster. Um, as well, uh, some, sometimes you want a little bit more of the background. Like that last shot, I wanted the background very blurred with just the grasses that were right on it. But with this one, um, seeing those purple flowers in the background and knowing that that's a complementary color to the oranges and, and reds on the uh, uh, lantana in the front, um, I lined up that shot and I had seen the hummingbird feeding on that lantana. And so I just lined up and waited uh, maybe five, 10 minutes uh, for it to come to this particular flower. And so there, it's a, definitely takes a little bit of patience when you're working with, uh, with these insects. And obviously this is not an insect, but it is a pollinator. And so uh, when you're working with these creatures, they, they won't pose for you. Um, the, that's the drawback to, if, if you're working with people, you can tell them to pose exactly how you want, but with uh, live creatures, uh, they don't. But the upside, they don't ever get tired. They'll keep, you can keep taking pictures, uh, more and more pictures of them and they don't ever fatigue like people do. So um, in this shot here, um, I utilized a blend of um, natural light and artificial light. Uh, this one uh, with the diffused flash is how I lit the, the insect on the front. So you can get lots of details and a nice even lighting. But then at the same time, I lined it up specifically to where the, the sun was shining in from the back. So it created a really nice, uh, what's called a rim light, which as you can see around the edges of the, of the flower, uh, the little hairs on the flower and a little bit on the wing and the belly of the, of the bee there, you can see that it's got a really, really nice uh, rim that gives it like a glow. And so you can create some really cool uh, lighting effects. That's 100% natural. The blues in the background are just more flowers that are a little bit blurred back there with a little bit of sunlight on them. And uh, so, you know, play around with, uh, with the scene, adjust your angle um, and see, uh, see what you can come up with. Um, move on. Sometimes you don't necessarily want a lot of uh, a lot of background. You want to just create something that looks a little bit uh, more um, surreal. Um, and so for this shot, I really separated the background from the subject to just really make it just a very blurry uh, uh, colors, you know. And so there's a 
really a pretty shot there on top of a flower and then a couple of flowers in the background on either side that just kind of created this really complimentary, almost uh, uh, surreal kind of image. Another thing uh, with studying the scene, um, if you're looking to do photography uh, at least part-time as in to make a living at it, um, being able to sell your photos, you need to be thinking about something, uh, particularly if you're wanting to sell photos to individuals. Um, th this is something that I talk to a lot of photographers about um, that you have to think in terms, not just of, of uh, the technical aspects of things, but also think about what is a, a picture that somebody would want to put on their wall. And, and when you get to think more about that, you start thinking a lot more about, you know, the entire composition and sometimes even finding images uh, that can work together. And so like when I, this is a uh, blue bonnet, although it's red, there's actually seven different shades of blue bonnets. And in knowing that I was able to go to a field where I had uh, several different colors of blue bonnets. And over the course of maybe an hour or two spending some time that, out there in the field, I was able to capture a series of shots uh, that work really nicely together. I actually uh, cropped these into squares and they've been some really popular shots for me when I've uh, sold them at, uh, at different uh, festivals and uh, uh, shows like that. So having the red, white, and blue like that is, is patriotic. It's, uh, and then it's also been very popular here in Texas as well. Those colors are with our flag as well here. <clears throat> All right, moving on to, uh, to understanding your equipment. Uh, it's really important that you get to know your equipment and that you don't just keep your camera in auto. Um, auto is, uh, is fine if you're, uh, if you just got the camera and you really quickly want to be able to take a picture, but try to very quickly understand how your camera works and how to adjust the settings so that you get the picture that you want versus the camera deciding what the picture should look like. Um, I, I do this and, and I'll, again, I'll talk a little bit more later as I get into the, the specific uh, technical settings and things like that. But I, uh, uh, w w the camera will, will try to always create a certain uh, exposure. And sometimes you want a darker background or a lighter background. And so uh, if you just set it on aperture priority or uh, shutter priority or something like that, you're gonna let the camera make way too many decisions for you. And you should always be the one that's in control of your art. So also uh, the, the megapixels of your camera, uh, you need to think about what makes sense for you and the type of photography that you wanna do. For me, um, I have the Sony a7R 3 which is a 42 megapixel camera. It's a lot of megapixels uh, because I wanted something that I could uh, crop in uh, pretty well with since I was uh, taking pictures of, of insects and pollinators and things like that. Um, so I went from the Sony a6000 to the Sony a7 II and then eventually, like I said, to the Sony uh, a7R 3 and because I wanted those extra megapixels so that I could uh, crop uh, extra. Uh, full frame versus crop sensor. Crop sensor is going to give you a little bit of crop automatically. And so some people like it for that. I personally prefer full frame because I like the extra dynamic range that you get. Uh, the larger pixels, uh, to me, uh, they just are more pleasing. Um, and you, you get a lot more uh, flexibility in terms of lighting options with, with full frame. But if you have a crop sensor, you, you just got to think about that in terms of how you're lighting uh, the situation. And uh, it, it, so I'm not saying one is better or one is worse, just saying get the tools that allow you to get the, the kind of shots that you want to get. Um, focusing speed is very important. Uh, minis, minimum focusing distance you got to pay attention to. Um, you got to make sure that you've got a lens that will allow you to get as close as you need to and get the magnification that you need to. You should know the sharpest range of your lens. Typically between about F8 F and F12 is gonna be where most lenses is kind of that sweet spot. Um, I've found that with, uh, with my lenses, F10 seems to be just uh, really the, the best balance of sharpness while still letting in a good amount of light. Um, the uh, pre-focusing or, or focus limiting, does it have the ability uh, to uh, 
kind of you can control how far it's going to be able to focus. Um, a lot of the, um, the macro lenses have this ability and telephoto lenses as well have the ability to set a range within which it's going to limit how far it can focus. And so knowing how to utilize that can keep you from being frustrated. The, the camera keeps trying to focus uh, further away or too close or anything like that. Uh, using focus peaking, particularly when you're doing uh, up close macro to make sure that you're nailing the focus right on the eyes. Um, that can definitely uh, uh, benefit you. And, but you can do really good macro photography even with a, a phone these days if you, they've got some pretty decent macro lenses. Uh, you're just going to have to have really good lighting conditions in order to, uh, to do that. And of course, you're not going to be able to zoom in when you're using a, um, a phone uh, as your camera because of the size of the sensor. Um, Moving on here, this, although I will uh, say here, this is a good example of, of pre-focusing. Um, I, I lined up the shot that I wanted and I knew that the hummingbirds kept coming back to this uh, popular uh, salvia here. And so I, I lined up and pre-focused on the flowers and so that when the hummingbird arrived, then it was really just a, a tiny adjustment over to the, uh, to the hummingbird. Uh, hummingbirds are pretty skittish and I wasn't that far away. I was maybe five, six feet away from it. Uh, when I captured this shot, they are pretty small. Um, so I was maybe five, six feet away. And so you want to make very, be able to move very subtly. So I don't typically shoot on a tripod for this shot. I did use a monopod. Um, but I feel like tripods do restrict my ability to move around like I like to. So it's either handheld or in a situation like this, where I'm going to be waiting for a little while for the for the subject to return that I might go ahead and use a monopod. And, and so uh, I use a uh, spot uh, autofocus and, and like I said, I'll go a little bit more into that here in just a moment. So uh, my equipment specifically for the, the in-flight uh, photography, which is definitely one of the things that I'm uh, more known for as far as my, uh, my macro work goes um, is the, like I said, the A7R3. I typically use the, uh, the Sony 100 to 400 uh, telephoto lens with a 1.4 teleconverter. Uh, so I'm basically shooting usually at 560 millimeters. And the reason I like that is it basically allows me to zoom in really close to the subject without having to get too close to it. So I, if, if there's a flower uh, three or four feet away from me, um, I don't have to crawl on top of some other flowers or I don't have to disturb the subject too much in order to uh, set up for my shot and, and get the shot that I want. Um, and, and then that gives me still a three foot focusing distance. So I can get pretty close and get quite a bit of magnification. And, and so that, that works for me. I had done it with a 70 to 200, but I was having to crop more than I wanted to. So that's why I ended up going to the 100 to 400. Um, as far as uh, the macro, I also do, I, if you guys noticed on the very first uh, uh, slide, I had a picture of a, of a honeybee and I probably should have said something about it then, but I've got some other shots coming up in flight like that. And I did say with the, uh, the sand wasp as well, that that was done like that. So I'll use the 90 millimeter macro lens with the 77 millimeter uh, NACI close-up lens. That gives me about an extra 30% um, magnification. And so it's not a ton, but it makes a big difference in uh, how much you need to crop. And, uh, and it, the other thing that it does that I really like is that it limits um, your, your focusing range. Uh, so it, the, the 90 millimeter macro uh, will, you, you've got two options uh, for, uh, for the focus limiting or actually three, um, but the, the, when, with the NACI lens on there, it zooms it in a little bit and controls uh, its ability to go out uh, to the farther range. So if uh, I can uh, utilize more of the options on that uh, lens when I'm using the NISI on top of it. Uh, I've used, I have used natural light most of the time, although this year, as I started experimenting with artificial light, I really fell in love with uh, capturing images this way. And so it's probably going to be uh, going into next season, how I, um, one of, one of my primary focuses. Um, but I will say that for, um, photos that I could create a print out of that I would put on the wall or something like that. It's usually natural light tends to be a little bit more pleasing, uh, for the entire composition. 
this shot here um, was almost the entire frame. It's barely cropped here. Um, and this uh, was possible using that 100 to 400 uh, plus the uh, 1.4 teleconverter and the dragonfly was maybe, maybe five feet away from me. Um, and it was hovering in place for about three or four seconds. So I was able to uh, line up that shot. Uh, obviously natural light there. And here's what my setup looks like when I'm using the, uh, the 90 millimeter macro lens with the uh, Nisi uh, close up on top of it. Um, it, it doesn't thread directly on there. I have to use a step up ring, uh, but that's not, uh, not really a big deal. Those are pretty inexpensive. Here's another example of a shot, uh, using the, uh, the 90 with the, uh, the Nisi, uh, close-up lens and again, using diffused light. So with this one, I did crank up the ISO a little bit more than I normally would with close-up macro. Um, usually with macro, and with most, any type of photography, you're typically wanting to keep your ISO as low as possible so you don't uh, add noise to the shot. But I always, I always decide as an artist versus as a technician, what do I want out of the composition? And so for this shot, I wanted more of the background. I didn't want a black background. I wanted uh, some of that color that was in the background. So I cranked up the ISO a little bit and adjusted down the flash so that um, it, it would be a, an even amount of, light on the the insect and this one was would feed on a flower and pop off of the flower it was as you can see it's got quite a bit of pollen on it and it would kind of hover in space for a little bit kind of brushing that pollen off and cleaning itself off and then go on to the next flower and so when i noticed that going back to the uh, tip that i gave about um studying the subject um i realized that if i would just watch it go to the next flower and then line up my shot on the flower and wait for it to pop off and uh, hover there it, it did this repeatedly, repeatedly enough that I was able to get uh, several uh, pretty cool shots with that. Uh, <clears throat> jumping into my uh, settings for, uh, for my flight shots, um, it depends on if obviously if I'm using uh, flash or if I'm using natural light. Um, so first of all, when I'm uh, shooting in, in natural light and, and actually for any type of uh, photography, like I said, I'm, I'm always in manual mode. Um, and I'll, I'll go, I'll show an example here in just a couple of minutes of why it can be, uh, so important. But, um, but as I mentioned, you know, if you're shooting in manual mode, you have a lot more control of, of everything you always want to expose for the subject. Um, it, I, I listened a few weeks ago to, uh, Chris, Crosby, I uh, believe is his last name. Uh, the other photographer, he does landscape photography. He's a Nisi ambassador. And he was talking about the, uh, the exposure and wanting to make sure that you have a nice even exposure throughout the whole uh, image. And that's very true for landscape photography, but for um, photography of, of animals or of people, you sometimes want um, a dark background or, or an overexposed background. Uh, you want to make sure that the, that the subject uh, of your portrait is the, uh, the thing that's in focus, or I mean, not that's in focus, that's uh, exposed correctly. And so uh, making sure that you're, when you're in manual mode, you can make sure that you tell the camera to expose for the subject instead of for the background, which may be too bright or too dark. So anyway, uh, choose manual mode, set your aperture, um, I like F10 for insects. Like I said, it's, it's the sharpest setting. Plus it gives me a decent depth of field and a decent amount of light. It, for me, that seems to be my, my sweet spot, but anywhere between about F9 and F13 is, uh, where most macro photographers tend to shoot. Um, the uh, shutter speed for in flight, again, with natural light, um, you'll be about one eight hundred to one sixteen hundredth of a second because you're trying to freeze the uh, the movement and uh you uh when you're shooting with uh artificial light though you can freeze the movement with the light and i'll talk a little bit more about that um on one of the uh the other pictures as i get into uh, that but you can set your your shutter a lot slower and freeze it with the flash instead um i set the iso to uh, auto but um, i adjust the compensation dial again, to uh, set it to the subject. So if I have a really bright background, my subject would be underexposed, or if I have a really dark background, my subject would be overexposed because it would try to make the background 
um, the, the right exposure. And so um, you adjust that exposure compensation dial to make sure that it's the subject that's um, in correct focus or in correct exposure. And, uh, and then uh, take your shots like that. I use selective spot autofocus, I mentioned that. Um, if you use the, uh, the wide uh, autofocus, it's going to pick all kinds of things in the scene and, and it's not typically gonna pick your subject. So you've gotta tell the camera what you wanna focus on. So um, I always tell people to uh, use selective spot, use as small of a spot as you can um, for larger subjects, uh, you might need one that's a little bit uh, of a larger spot, but use as small of a spot as you can so that you can be as precise um, as possible when you're uh, focusing in. Uh, so here's an example of where exposure compensation is uh, super important. In this shot here, I was shooting into a really dark background and the uh, I actually had to crank up the exposure compensation by about three stops in order to have the, the B properly exposed because it was such a dark background. The camera was trying to make it really, really bright. And so I, I actually dialed it down rather, I should say, so that the background would stay dark, uh, almost, almost black. It was actually, there was actually a tinge of green to it in the original shot. And then I just, uh, in post-processing, uh, adjusted that so it would be solid black because I really thought that was... Uh, the most complimentary for, for the image. But um, shooting at about 1 1600th of a second here, and there was basically a dark tree line behind this, uh, this bee with uh, the sun just starting to come up over. Uh, so this is a good example of multiple tips that I've given you right here. It was in the morning, so they're moving a little bit more slowly. It was feeding on flowers that um, are heavy in pollen. Uh, if you watch bees on flowers that are pollen heavy, uh, you'll notice that they tend to have to clean themselves off after being on that, that flower. And so they'll typically pop up and hover in place. And this gives you some great opportunities to capture them like this in flight, which otherwise is, like I said, it's very difficult. It's very difficult even like this. But um, if you, you uh, watch for them when they're feeding on heavy pollinated flowers, you'll, uh, you'll have some better chances like that. This one, um, it, that, that's a damselfly and it was actually in a field. It wasn't next to a pond. Uh, damselflies are typically next to ponds, but I was walking through a field and there was a, uh, it was, I guess within um, 100 to 150 feet of a pond. But as I was walking through the field, this, uh, this damselfly I noticed flew up and I stopped as I saw it fly and it just kind of hovered in place and then went back to its perch. <clears throat> so I adjusted my positioning and, uh, and grabbed a, a twig. So uh, this, I guess this is as close as I'll come to um, messing with the environment in order to get the shot that I want. So I, I used the twig to kind of reach for it a little bit and, and so that it would jump up off of its uh, perch and hover in that same spot again. Unfortunately, it did go right back to a very similar spot to where it had, I had seen it go the first time. And so, and I was squatted down on the ground for that and was able to nail that shot, uh, bullseye shot like that of the, uh, the damselfly. Um, I'm gonna see if I can close this down a little bit here. There we go. Um, so as far as my technique, um, I, I always look for, first of all, how the light is hitting the subject um, find also a good look, finding a good location, uh, an area that's got good activity. Um, like I had mentioned, you know, looking at, um, are there flowers around that have lots of pollen if you're dealing with, uh, pollinators, um, or is it a pond with a lot of dragonflies and a lot of damselflies if you're, if that's what you're looking for. Um, I pre-focus to the intended distance, um, for this shot, I was a little bit further away. I wanted a little bit more of the background. And I actually didn't set out that day to capture two dragonflies in one shot. Uh, but I, I do know that one of the ways that you can capture dragonflies is, like I had mentioned early uh, mating behaviors, but also uh, when they are patrolling a territory, if they see another male come in, they'll kind of jockey for uh, and get into a little bit of a fight, jockeying for that area. 
And so they'll kind of chase each other around and hover, not, not hover, but uh, fly above each other and beside each other and kind of, and try to get into fights. And so really all that I was trying to do was take advantage of that uh, to get uh, locked focus on one of the dragonflies and uh, fortunately managed to uh, click a couple of shots with both of them in the, in the uh, frame and both of them in focus. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. Got a two for one with that. Um, you know, play with your, uh, with your point of view, um, right here, play with your point of view, uh, for this shot here, I wanted, um, the, uh, the flowers in the background. And again, when you're, when you're dealing with subjects like these, you don't always get to, um, select, uh, what your background is going to be, but or at least not exactly what your background is going to be, but you can select generally what it's going to be. You can decide on your angle. And so I, for this one, I'm uh, either kneeling or squatted down on the ground. And so, so that I'm at the same level as the flowers. And um, I was tracking actually this be this one, uh, as you can see, it's butts covered in pollen. And so as they get a little bit more covered in pollen, they start moving a little bit more slowly and having to take more time to clean themselves off. And so uh, with this one, um, it fortunately lined up right in front of this flower for me, and I was able to uh, capture the shot of it with the flower uh, just in a nice blurry uh, bouquet in the background. This one uh, here, uh, this is a uh, cicada killer uh, wasp. A lot of people think it's a murder hornet, and it is not. Uh, so if you see one of these uh, next spring or next summer, do not kill them. They are totally harmless. They don't mess with people. Uh, cicada killers, uh, they, they will, the males will fly at you as if they're going to do something, but they don't have a stinger. So they really can't do anything. And this is a male here. Uh, they have the false stinger. You see, you'll notice the little tip on its tail, but it, it can't really do anything with it. Um, so this one was patrolling a territory, kind of flying back and forth around and uh, for this one, I had to track it because it never really hovered in one spot. And so um, I mentioned there, you know, that if you're tracking to turn off your image stabilization um, with a lot of cameras, uh, with, with telephoto lenses, you usually have the option for uh, image stabilization type one and type two. And um, if you switch between those, what, what the two different types do, one gives you stabilization in all aspects up and down and side to side. Whereas the, the second mode uh, will only give you stabilization up and down. So if you're tracking like a moving vehicle or in this instance, a moving uh, bee, it's not gonna try to fight you as you're following and tracking the, the subject. So uh, making sure that you, you have the right type of image stabilization if you're gonna use it. Um, if your shutter speed is over one one thousandth of a second, though, you really probably don't need image stabilization. Like I said, unless you're just locked in on trying to lock in on something that is hovering in place and you're trying to make sure that you frame it exactly right. It, it does definitely come in handy there, even with the faster shutter speed. All right, uh, next, uh, the equipment that I use for uh, what I call standard macro. Um, I, all of my work is, is type of, is essentially macro and close up, but there's definitely a uh, different types of uh, uh, styles of, of shooting that I do. Like I said, the, the in-flight, I call that in-flight and then the more traditional uh, close up of a stationary subject with um, perfect lighting uh, with a diffused flash and all that is what I'll call standard macro. And there again, I've got my Sony a7R III. Um, I, uh, I'll use either the 90 millimeter uh, Sony macro lens or the, uh, the 50 millimeter uh, macro lens. And uh, of course this year I added with the introduction of Nisi to uh, ha having these close up lens kits um, so what, what's interesting, they, uh, I saw that it was being uh, promoted as a add-on for a telephoto lens, uh, but I decided I wanted to try it um, with a standard macro lens to see what it would do. And um, like I said, it was really impressed with the, the quality of the image. And with the 77, you get um, 
you don't get as much magnification, but you get about a 30% magnification. And then with the 58, you get twice as much. So you get about 60, uh, 65% magnification. Um, and so you get a lot more magnification, but you lose working distance uh, when you get go to the 58 and you also lose depth of field. So just like with the, the each of the lenses, the Sony 90 millimeter lets me shoot from a little bit further away than the 50 millimeter. Um, and it gives me a more uh, true picture versus the 50 millimeter uh, Sony macro lens gives a little bit more of a wide angle look. If you guys uh, have ever uh, experimented with wide angle and uh, portrait lenses, you guys know the difference where that wide angle lens is going to uh, kind of uh, make more dramatic the, uh, the depth of field and the, whatever's closer to the camera is going to get exaggerated and enlarged. And I'll show uh, a couple of examples uh, coming up here of, of the difference between the 90 and the 50 millimeter and how it can change the look of the image. But like I said, when you add on that, that 77 and 58, it basically just magnifies what's going into the, the camera. So you're, you're, I don't have to crop as much later. Um, I do use the 77 um, as my uh, lens of choice on the 90 if it's gonna be an in-flight shot. Um, if it's going to be the close up macro or a really small subject, uh, I prefer the 58, um, so that I get, uh, that additional magnification. Um, I use a, uh, a Godox V862 flash. I don't have any relationship with Godox, but I do, uh, that people ask me what flash I use. And so that's, that's the flash that I use. Um, I use, uh, for my light diffuser, I, I had my own homemade one. Uh, and, uh, there's a, there's a guy, uh, that makes a, uh, custom diffusers here in the U S uh, this company is called AK, uh, diffusers. And, uh, he offered to, uh, have me try one of his out. And so I tried it and I really liked it. It, it provided better light, um, better, uh, stronger light. So I was able to keep the power a little bit lower on my flash, uh, than what I'd been using on my homemade diffuser and more softer and more diffused. So I really, really uh, highly recommend it. And I do have a relationship with him. So if you're interested in that, um, email me and, and I can talk to you guys about how to get one of those. Um, with, the, uh, with the 90 millimeter and the 58, you can really get up close. This is an owl fly, um, very, very tiny uh, insect and you're able to zoom in. A lot of macro uh, buffs, map, macro photography buffs like to see those uh, up close details. That's one of the things that fascinates us about macro is being able to see the, those amazing details. And typically the eyes are, are extremely intricate. And so it's really cool to be able to zoom in there and see, uh, things that you wouldn't be able to necessarily see with the naked eye. Um, the, the other thing that I like, uh, with using, uh, so I will say actually this one was shot with the 77. Um, and it was just really cropped in. This one was shot with the 58 and still cropped in, but didn't have to crop it as much. Um, I believe the head is really only about two or three millimeters uh, wide. It's a, it's a, one of the smaller drag damselflies. This is a, a desert flyer, a uh, desert fire tail damselfly. And, uh, I managed to catch it while it was mating with a female and that, and so it, uh, the female was holding on to the twig instead of him and he was just kind of dangling in the air. So I was, uh, had a, a captive audience and I was act actually able to uh, capture several shots of it. Um, but with the, uh, the 58, like I said, it didn't have to quite uh, uh, crop as much and able to get quite a bit more detail out of the shot. Um, I also uh, like shooting with the, uh, the 50 millimeter Oh, that, that's one thing that I didn't uh, say here. So if, if I am worried about a more skittish subject like damselflies, particularly, they're very, very skittish. Um, being able to shoot from a little bit further away um, is, a, is a real plus. So if you can put on a lens that gives you additional magnification without having to get closer, that's um, sometimes I use the Nisi to give me uh, greater than one-to-one -one magnification, but sometimes I use it to get one-to-one -one from a little bit further away. And so, you know, use the tools that you have in different ways to um, capture uh, sub different subjects, you know, that 
require different things in order to, to get them. Um, like I said, I do also have the 50 millimeter macro lens, which is a shorter lens uh, and it's got a uh, shorter working distance. So like with a 90, without the, the and either of the Nisi's uh, lenses on it, the working distance, minimum working distance is 11 inches. With this uh, 50 millimeter, it's uh, six inches. So uh, to get one to one, you gotta get really, really close. Um, now with this shot here, um, this was actually without any, uh, this was shot la uh, last year or the year before. And um, the reason I like this shot is because it really shows what that 50 millimeter does as far as um, exaggerating the features that are closest to the camera, the head and the wings, it looks really wide and really short. And, and it almost kind of gives a more cartoonish look, which I think is a really cool look. And so, but it, it is a little bit more difficult to work with. Um, it doesn't focus as easily as the 90 millimeter macro lens. And so I'll typically have the 90 on there uh, most of the time uh, with the, uh, now with the Nisi 77, cause that gives me the most flexibility. And then if I have a subject that's being cooperative and I want to try something different with the, with the look, um, I'll go ahead and switch uh, to the uh, 50 millimeter, like for this shot here. And what you can see here uh, also, just like with the other one that the, the features are exaggerated. So um, the eyes look even a little bit bigger and more uh, dramatic uh, up a little bit closer to the, to the camera. And the other thing by being up closer, the light and shrouds the subject a little bit more behind it. And so you're, uh, it, it's, a, it's almost, I don't want to say brighter uh, behind it, but it's definitely brighter than with the 90 where you're a little bit more in front of the subject. And so the light surrounds the subject a little bit more and you've got a, a broader uh, area of uh, diffusion. So it, it creates a little bit of a different look like that. And that's how the diffuser fits onto the, uh, the flash. It, like I said, it is custom made, so you have to make sure that if you're if you're interested in one of these, you need to. Um, uh, it's it's made specifically to the lens and the uh, flash that, and camera that you use. Um, my settings uh, for standard macro again, I shoot in in manual mode, um, and as you saw with the uh, with the previous uh, example of that that B with the dark background. Sometimes you want a brighter background. And again, if you're not shooting in manual mode, you're just not gonna have as much control over what the entire composition looks like. So learn to shoot in manual mode, learn to uh, adjust the settings to get the composition that you want out of it versus what just whatever the camera happens to give you. Um, once again, at F10, that's kind of my, my sweet spot, although anywhere between about F9 and F16. Um, and then your shutter speed, I'm typically shooting at about 1 60th to 1 200th because I am shooting um, moving subjects a lot of times. Um, I'm also shooting in windy conditions a lot of times. And so I need to be able to um, control that movement a little bit. So I, I like to keep the, uh, the shutter speed a little, bit, um, a little bit faster there working with the flash as well to uh, control that movement. Again, the, the ISO, you want to keep it fairly low. And I, I, I know I said earlier that you, you want to keep it as low as possible, but again, that's an artistic choice. Um, I actually typically lock it up around 200 uh, to 250 or even as high as 400. Uh, to me, it ad adds a little bit of texture to the image. Um, and and I, I don't have to crank up the flash as much and and it gives me a little bit more background so for my artistic style uh with my photography um i like a little bit more iso most of the time uh, and again it's not all the time sometimes i'll lower it all the way down to 100 and crank up the flash a little bit more just depending on what i think is going to do best for the subject but you should develop a style you should um kind of create a look that you're known for with your images. Um, I'll get a little bit more into that later, but it's, it's, it's important as a photographer that you kind of establish your, your own style and that you be known for a particular style. Um, I typically set my flash, especially now with the, uh, 
uh, AK diffuser at about 1 16th power. The nice thing about 1 16th power, and I, I mentioned this earlier as far as freezing uh, movement, it, uh, at 1 16th, there, there's a thing um, in flash power called the, the T time, which is basically the, uh, the speed, the, it's called the speed light uh, really more than uh, flash is, is uh, not really the correct term. It should be uh, called speed light. And the speed of, of which it flashes at 1 16th power is about, for most, uh, it's gonna be different from flashes, but you know, on mine, it's about one 5,000th of a second. And so that's going to freeze motion. If you control the ambient light um, in, uh, in other ways, then you can open the shutter almost as long as you want. And uh, you can go as low as one one hundredth or even lower than that, as long as there's no, if, if it's dark enough conditions or like, so you control the ambient light enough um, to where only the flash is lighting up your subject and your scene, you're going to freeze motion. And, uh, and so you're, you're able to uh, freeze movement, uh, not just via shutter speed, but also by flash. When I'm approaching a subject, um, I typically want to get a few shots from a little bit further away um, so that I make sure that I get a, a usable shot at least, uh, document the subject. Uh, also, sometimes I like the fuller scene better. And even when I get up close, um, if I end up getting a, an extreme close-up shot, uh, I end up deciding, you know what, I, I like the fuller shot of, of the subject a little bit better with more of the scene in it. So. While I'm doing that, um, I typically, I'm, a, I'm doing that a lot of times with one hand um, because I'm either crawling on the ground using my elbow on the other arm or I'll uh, grab the, the stem of the flower and pull it towards me with one hand and, and uh, hold the camera with the other hand. And so when you're shooting like that, you don't have a third hand to be able to adjust your, your focus. So I use uh, selective spot autofocus um, as well when I'm approaching and getting a little bit more of the scene. But then once I get in there up close, I go ahead and switch to manual focus and, uh, and make sure that I'm at one-to-one -one magnification for that real extreme up close uh, type of photography. And that's gonna be a lot more accurate on the specific area that you wanna focus on. Uh, one thing that I learned uh, before getting into macro photography, and I'm, I'm glad, uh, I studied uh, portrait photography and landscape uh, photography pretty extensively. Not, uh, not any formal classes, uh, but a lot of online uh, tutorials and uh, the, uh, uh, I forget what, uh, I forget the name of the, uh, the program, but it, it's a, they, they have uh, different professional photographers and different professionals from different fields um, that teach you how to uh, do different things. And uh, I've watched a lot of the uh, tutorials on photography specifically uh, with portrait, like I said, and with landscape. And with portraits, I learned that the most important thing to have in focus are the eyes. Uh, it's what our eyes as a viewer are drawn to in a picture. Uh, if it's a picture of a person, um, and, or, and, and then I assume that the same would be true, uh, dealing with, uh, uh, an animal. And so it, it just made sense to me. And, and it, once I took the pictures, it instantly was like, yeah, that's correct. If you don't nail the focus on the eyes, it's going to look off focus, even if everything else is in focus. So make sure that you nail the focus on the eyes. Uh, you can also do focus stacking. Um, if you like focus stacking, I, because I'm typically dealing with, um, uh, moving subjects, I don't really do, uh, focus stacking, but, uh, if you're dealing with dead subjects or if you're dealing with, uh, like if you're, uh, photographing just a flower or something that's this, you don't have to worry about moving around on you. You can do, uh, focus stacking, but you'll still want to make sure you get one shot specifically on the eyes and then focus on the other parts, uh, to create your stack. Um, I, I like to, uh, go out early in the morning. Like I mentioned, um, I'm not naturally a morning person, but I made myself a morning person in order to, uh, get some, some cool shots because like I said, I know I've learned that they're moving a little bit more slowly. You can capture them with, with dew, uh, drops on them and you just see some things that you don't see at any other time of day. So, 
making sure that you get out at various times of day and learning what's uh, there for you at those different times is, uh, is important. Uh, for this shot, I, uh, this is a carmine skimmer. It's a really intense red. Uh, and, and then its body is almost like a purplish, uh, maroon color. And so to me, when, as, when I uh, lined up the shot, I just immediately thought that it needed a darker background. Um, uh, and so I adjusted the angle to, uh, this is actually shooting from above. And so the subject was far enough away from the ground that, uh, it just created this really dramatic looking image with a dark background like that. Uh, so think about what you want as, as you saw in a, in a previous shot um, of uh, this one here, I wanted the background in it. And so I lined myself up differently and uh, made sure to do, uh, adjust the settings to include more of the background. But for this one, I wanted that dark background to create just a really uh, dramatic um, artistic kind of look. Um, Make sure that you, like I said, you focus on the eyes or at least on the head if you're using uh, the spot autofocus. Uh, take a lot more shots than you think you need um, because you're, especially if you're dealing with moving subjects uh, that move very quickly, very uncooperative, um, you're, a, a lot of times you, you may nail um, all of the shots on the eyes, but you look back at them and that you've got like 15, 20 shots and you realize that there's two or three that just, there's something about the angle of the head, uh, the, the way, the angle that you are to the subject that looks a lot more compelling than the other shots. And so do that, be, be self-critical enough to say that not all of your shots are, are great, uh, that you've got some good shots and that, you know, every once in a while you get that real wow shot. And so in order to, increase the number of times that you're going to get that wow shot, uh, you've got to take a lot of shots. And uh, so spend time out there, take, take lots of pictures of the, the, the same subject. And, uh, you know, like I said, just take more shots than you, than you really think you need. Uh, the other thing that um, I, I tell people is that you can't just stop uh, once you take the picture in camera. You need to, uh, Ansel Adams said, you don't take a photograph, you make a photograph. Now he was uh, obviously the, the, one of the most famous landscape photographers of all time, um, but he was more of the, the era of uh, film. And so he would spend time in the dark room. Well, we have uh, the digital versions of that these days. I use Lightroom and I also use uh, Topaz uh, suite of software. Um, I really, I, I used to, uh, just use Lightroom. I'm not a big fan of Photoshop, uh, primarily because I'm a little bit lazy. And I don't uh, like having to learn all of that stuff in there. Um, there's so many, uh, uh, it, it, it just takes a lot of time to, to learn how to do different things uh, within Photoshop. And if, if you don't spend a lot of time with it, uh, it's going to be a struggle. And I found Lightroom to be a lot more intuitive. Um, I found it to just make sense. It was real easy to play around with the sliders and kind of get, get what I wanted and um, play around with, uh, with the different things. But I, I was never fully satisfied with the uh, denoise and with the, the sharpening. I always felt like that it was a little bit um, not, not real smart the way that it did those. So when I saw the Topaz uh, ads uh, earlier this year on Instagram, uh, I said, you know what, let me try this out. It seemed a little bit gimmicky, uh, but when I actually tried it, I was like, wow, this really works. And um, it, it does, it doesn't, it, it allows you to do an auto setting, but then you can adjust from there. And I really, uh, I utilize that all the time. I'll basically uh, import the image into Lightroom, do some basic exposure adjustments, make sure that I'm, I'm happy with the white balance and temperature and and the basic contrast and then i'll export it to uh to the whatever topaz software is most appropriate if it's a close-up and my iso is really low i'll use the uh the sharpen uh app if the iso is really high for the shot then i'll use the denoise because both of them denoise has a sharpening feature as well in it and sharpen has a denoise feature to it but 
each one does the, the particular thing it's designed for better. And sometimes I'll utilize both, uh, but for the most part, um, you're able to get the exact results that you want within there. Then I'll bring it back to Lightroom. And then within Lightroom, I'll uh, do some additional um, adjustments in there. And that's a, that's a whole other uh, webinar. Uh, I actually, that's one of the things that I wanna uh, work on uh, creating next is a, uh, a webinar on uh, post-processing uh, and how, how I go about create, taking an image that looks uh, like it does on the left where you see it's kind of grainy and some of the details aren't real sharp uh, to the image on the right where it's uh, really clean and really sharp and you can see all the details of the image. And knowing how to use, having the right software and knowing how to use that software is uh, what it's all about. And, uh, I could definitely help you with that. And as well um, with, uh, with the Topaz software, I do have a, a relationship with them. So um, I can help you with, with that. Um, as far as uh, social media, I export at 10, uh, 1080 pixels wide. Uh, on, I typically uh, am using this aspect ratio, which is a four to five uh, portrait aspect ratio. Um, because it, it takes, it gives you the, it fills the, uh, screen best for a phone and 1080 pixels wide is the maximum that Instagram will allow and that sRGB color space. And so if you do that, you end up making sure that you have really good sharp images that, um, that have some wow impact on Instagram, because that's, <clears throat> that's really what it's all about with uh, with Instagram is that you've got to immediately grab people's attention on there. And um, as much as we want to be artists at the same time, if nobody's looking at your art, you're not really going to be successful with, with uh, as an artist. So take your art and amp it up a little bit to where it, um, it catches people's eye. Um, Presentation is another thing that, uh, and that's a whole other subject, but that's essentially what it's about. It, like um, if you selling uh, your photo, you know, how you frame it, um, whether you use canvas or uh, traditional print can make the difference in, in how an image is received by the public. So think about that too, when you're doing, uh, preparing your pictures to share with the world on Instagram, um, edit them, make them really, uh, look exciting to you so that when other people look at them, um, they'll also be excited about it. Um, this is, so the previous one was an example of what you can do with the denoise. Uh, this is an example of how much of a different sharpening uh, makes. Uh, a lot of times people don't, you don't realize it until you actually uh, sharpen an image that it's not really as sharp as, as uh, you think it, it might be. And going in there, and utilizing the right tools, uh, it's gonna just really make it pop and jump off the page. Um, you gotta be careful that you don't over sharpen, uh, but you definitely do want to uh, sharpen and not, not underdo that. Um, and so that's, uh, that's pretty much what I've got. Um, I uh, got this, this saying here to create art and have fun. Um, don't let yourself get handcuffed by technical aspects. That's one of the things in macro that I see uh, a lot is that people, people that do macro because they like those details, uh, they become too technical of photographers and don't really create images that, um, that are that, that are compelling that, that people, um, would want that the general public would want. You know, as macro photographers, uh, it's real easy to, if, if you're into macro photography, to look at a, a macro photo and think it's really good. But um, if a general viewer looks at it and doesn't feel anything from it, uh, then you're, you're reaching a very limited audience. And so uh, try to capture images that, and create images uh, through your post processing that um, will make more people than just, uh, you know, other people that are in a macro uh, be moved by, by what you do. That's what art is. Art should, um, should make you feel something from it rather than just uh, be technically perfect. As a matter of fact, I always use this example. Like when I first got into macro photography, uh, 
I, I didn't have a good diffuser. Uh, I wasn't doing everything technically perfect, but people were still really loving my photos. And, but I remember having somebody that uh, was very well-meaning, uh, but told me, you know, Hey, have you ever thought about trying this or, or that for, for your, for your light? And, and I said, you know, yeah, but I'm, I'm happy with my, my photos and I wouldn't want to take a picture that looks like your picture because then it's your art. You know, if, if I, uh, listen to the advice that you're giving me, then I'm going to take your picture instead of my picture. And so I, uh, always encourage people to be, be rebellious, you know, don't, um, don't get handcuffed by technical aspects. Don't think that you have to do it a certain way. Now, if you like a certain look, then learn how to create that look, but have fun with it and, uh, create, uh, be, be creative and don't be afraid. Like, um, with punk rock, that's an example that I always give punk rock is a style of music that is technically bad. Uh, musicians, they, they're usually not that talented on, uh, technically on the, uh, instruments and the singers aren't usually that great. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want to hear them sing the national anthem or anything like that. But uh, yet that music is really successful because it makes people feel something. And that's the same thing is true for any type of art. Pablo Picasso, prime example there of an artist that who, his artwork, it, it looks, uh, it doesn't look very realistic, uh, but it moves people. And so Think about that with your photography as well. Uh, take pictures that, that just make people stop and, and that it not just somebody who's a photographer or a macro photographer is impressed with, but, uh, but that the general public will look at and say, wow, you know, I, I'd love a, a copy of that. Um, if you're interested in, in buying my prints, they're available at my website, uh, pollinatorportraits.com. Um, as you saw on the first slide with Jim, um, I do, we do have a, a deal on the, the Nisi, uh, products, any, as any products, uh, but specifically, obviously we talked tonight about the, uh, the close up uh, lens kits. Um, and, uh, I also have, a, a, a deal with Topaz and with the AK diffuser. So if you're interested in those, you'll need to hit me up uh, specifically to get those via email. Uh, my Instagram account, I would love if you guys follow me. It's at JMAD Images. And on Facebook, I'm Pollinator Portraits by J Madrigal. So uh, look me up. Like I said, I'm always happy to answer questions. Feel free to email me. Feel free to DM me on social media. Um, I love to, uh, to help people out. As I said, my background, my first job out of college, I was actually a teacher. Uh, and I was also a personal trainer for a lot of years. I like to teach people. I like to help people. I like to see people succeed. I don't hold anything back. Um, I don't, um, I don't worry about you being able to, uh, do, uh, the same thing that I do. I, I don't feel like anything is a, a secret that I need to keep, uh, from anybody. So, you know, ask me and, um, uh, as long as I, I know, the answer i'll i'll share it with you all right and that is all that i got i was gonna say i am uh here i'm gonna actually uh put that uh that uh screen back up of the discount code okay hopefully that's there now yes yes yep. i see it great Right. Fantastic. Um, I, I mean, I could, I could just spend time telling you how much I loved watching what you were doing. I thought it was amazing. Thank you. Um, I know that there were some, well, there was at least one question for sure, which was, um, what about using extension tubes? So I, I did use extension tubes actually, um, uh, I won't mention the other brand, uh, but there was another brand uh, that is very commonly used um, uh, add-on um, uh, magnification for your lens that, that a lot of macro photographers use. Uh, and I found hey, that- Jose, feel free. Jose, feel free. Don't, don't worry. Sure. Okay, all right. It's uh, the Raynox uh, 250. Um, it's a really, really great uh, lens in terms of image quality, uh, but it's really difficult to focus with. And uh, 
it uh it also creates a little bit of vignette on on my images I, I was finding uh maybe i wasn't using it right but the the fact that i found it difficult to focus with i could see using it for uh for dead subjects and things like that but with the subjects that i was primarily photographing you know the fast moving stuff it just wasn't working for me um but i did want some additional magnification and so i tried using extension tubes and i i did like the additional magnification but one of the things that happens is uh, i believe it's called diffraction uh where you're basically pulling um uh, you're, when you move the, the, the lens a little bit further away from the sensor, the, the way that the, uh, you, if you guys know about how light comes into the lens, it actually flips as it goes onto the sensor and, and it spreads. And so the, the lens is designed to have the image hit perfectly on the sensor so that it's um, as, as sharp and as uh, correct as possible. When you use extension tubes, you, by pulling that away, it broadens the way that it hits onto the, the sensor and you end up losing some sharpness. And so that was uh, one of the things that, so if it was something that I was gonna use the entire image, uh, that was fine. But if I wanted to crop in uh, really tight, uh, I found that it, it wasn't uh, sharp enough, even using some sharpening tools. So I, I shied away from, I, it, from the Raynox and from the extent, I did use extension tubes more than I would use the Raynox for sure. But that's what I was just thrilled with, with the Nisi is that I don't have to worry about any loss of image quality. Um, it, because it's in front of the, uh, the lens, it's basically magnifying what's going into the lens and it, instead of pulling a little bit further away from the sensor, it's just magnifying what's getting to to the sensor so uh it was to me it was a real home run as far as uh option for for magnification well i can't tell you how much i appreciate it, how pleased you are with our products i really think that's great there's a question that came in from james that and by the way after i answer this question i'm gonna i'm gonna say something so hang tight on anything else sure. uh, James asked, would you ever use a Nisi Allure filter on a macro lens? Now, I wouldn't be surprised that um, Jose may not even know what an Allure filter is. An Allure filter is a um, is somewhat of a de-sharpening and light, di light uh, dispersing filter that gives an ethereal effect. Mm -hmm. And um, here, my, I, I'll answer that. Why not? try anything. You're shooting, you're taking pictures, throw it on there, see what the result is. And maybe that's, maybe that's the combination that'll be your special touch to your pictures, James. So I say, why not? Um, that's it. So here's what I, here's what I wanted to say. Um, feel free, use the chat. I'm happy to, to pass this along, but you can, unmute your, uh, your uh, microphone, ask a question. All I would ask is, is that after you've asked the question, turn the microphone back off. So that way, if your dog starts barking or your kid comes in, you know, people can hear the answers to the question. So I, inv I invite that of anyone right now. And I'm gonna, I haven't really done it before, but I believe that um, you, you're free to unmute your mic, your mic and if not, just chat, just send me in chat that you want your mic unmuted and I will unmute it. Sounds like someone. James here, can you hear me? Hi yes. James, yes. Oh good, okay, thanks so much for inviting me to this uh, awesome website here. Um, I do have a question, uh, for Jose, please. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I live uh, on the island of Maui. Um, I'm around the water a lot, and there's. Um, <clears throat> would uh, Would you use a uh, polarizer and uh, around the water shooting the bugs or crabs or any of the marine life there? And 
what would be your suggestion for the stops? Uh, three stop, six stop. Well, actually, James, you're you're asking about when you say three stop, six stop, that's neutral density, but the polarizing filter will decrease your exposure um, or the the amount of light coming into the camera yeah. by about one and a half about, about one one stop, one and a half stops. And again, I I mean, I want Jose, you can answer the question. I have my own opinion, but go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I'll answer it uh, for sure. I, I have uh, a polarizer uh, that I've used on my telephoto lens. Obviously, um, if you're doing wildlife photography, uh, there's definitely places for it. What I found that, yeah, you do lose a couple of stops. And when you're shooting at a really fast shutter speed, like I'm doing at 1 1600th of a second, um, I found that it by losing some of that light that um, it was... Uh, it was a little bit too much, too much of a trade-off for me. So I prefer shooting without the polarizer. Um, I don't know that I would use it on the, uh, the macro, uh, lens with diffused flash. I haven't really been in a situation where it's typically when you're doing that, you're, you're kind of controlling all the light. And one of the things with the polarizer, uh, that it does is uh, reduces glare from water and different things like that. And I just, I don't know that you would have a, a situation where you would really see much benefit from the polarizer, but um, th like I said, thus far, I've not needed it, but uh, certainly uh, like Jim said, with the, with the other uh, filter, try it, uh, see, see what you think, uh, what it does. I mean, it, if you're shooting in, in certain conditions, um, it, it may make sense for you. Like I said, I tried my polarizer, uh, when I was shooting the, the dragonflies in flight, uh, to see if I could help, um, with, uh, some of the highlights and things like that, that, uh, cause you're shooting at very bright times of day sometimes. Uh, and like I said, I just personally found that I liked better, um, overexposing by, by a third, uh, of a stop and, uh, making sure that I was at that right angle to where this, the, I wasn't getting harsh, um, uh, highlights, uh, on the, uh, on where it was affecting the, the image on the subject. So. Yeah. I, you know, what it does is just adds another layer of complication because you've got all these moving things and, you know, you want to activate the polarization and as you move and as you move the, uh, angle of the camera, to any reflective surface, you have to readjust the uh, polarizer. I mean, I would say in general, a polarizer on a, lens, on a lens is better than no polarizer at all. But I think in macro photography, unless you're doing still macro photography, unless you're doing, you know, getting away from the kind of stuff that uh, Jose does, but getting into objects and, and, and having more control over a subject and maybe being on a tripod, that then a polarizer can be very helpful in macro. But in, in this very rapidly moving situation, very dynamic situation, it could be a little bit, it could complicate things a little bit, James. But try it, please do. And by the way, if you are on Instagram and you tag your, and you, you're, you're posting, putting your pictures on Instagram, Please tag us, tag at Nisi Optics USA. That way we'll know that, you know, we should take a look at your photos. And that's how the photos that go on our uh, Instagram channel, which is seen by over 20,000 people. And on uh, long exposure shots, which is more of a landscape um, channel than a, than a macro channel. We're, we're more generalized on our Nisi Optics USA site. But our, our uh, curators who are Sydney based, uh, that's how they wind up looking at photos and, and putting out photos that they feel that um, our audience should be looking at. I wanna, I wanna mention that um, Jose had done something interesting with the close-up lens in that, and you heard him say this in his presentation is that we put a product out and we think we know how a product should be used and yet leave it to photographers to get a product of ours and change things around and do the things they want to do with it. 
the uh, close-up lens that he alluded to through most of his presentation of ours, in our mind was to go on a 70 to 200 or a 75, 300 or a 74, 100, 400 lens to give you macro capability on a lens that's uh, primarily meant for bringing distant uh, objects in close. And what it allows, in our mind, what it allows um, you to do is to have a macro lens with you without having to carry a macro lens with you. You just use your 70 to 200 as your macro lens. But look at what Jose is doing with the, uh, the close-up lens on a, on a macro lens. He's now taking a lens that can only go to life size, one-to-one, -one, and increasing the magnification significantly so that he actually captures in camera the image that he wants rather than getting close to the image that he wants and then having to do it in post. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the, 105, the Sigma 105 is incredible. Uh, one more question, how close are you with the TC setup, not true macro? That means that your um, your 100 to 400, your your uh, uh, Sony lens that goes to 400, Jose. Uh huh. Um, I mean, it. Uh, how close am I to the subjects when I shoot? Yeah. Oh, so I mean, any it really depends. Uh, the the minimum focusing uh, distance is three feet. And I try to be as close to that as possible, uh, but some subjects you just can't get that close to. Uh, but any anything with the size of the subjects that I'm shooting, the the very largest, um, there was a dragonfly that I showed in there uh, that, if you guys remember, it was a, a frontal shot of an in-flight dragonfly that was that I said was barely cropped. It was basically just just cropped into a, a four by five there, um, but the uh uh the the size of that i think they get to about 60 70 millimeters so because i'm dealing with really small subjects i don't want to get too far away uh because even though i have the ability to crop even with a 42 megapixel camera um you're just going to lose details and uh, doing macro photography or close-up photography again you know details are one of the things that um people really like in this type of uh uh, photography. So I, I'm don't let myself really be more than about, uh, 10, 12 feet away from a subject. If it's a, if it's a really large one like that, like a hummingbird or a large dragonfly, like I said, 10, 12 feet away, about as far, uh, the farthest that I want to be, but I'm typically within about that, that minimum of three feet and on up to about six to eight feet. That's, that's my usual working distance on, on subjects like that. Let, let me actually ask you something on that. I always, I always talk about uh, close-up and macro photography in terms of the field that I get. So at, at three feet and at 400, about what field are you getting um, height and width? Mm. Um, Would you it, say it's like two inches by three inches, four inches by six inches? I'm honestly not sure. I don't I, I, uh, and and see now I shoot with the 1.4 all on there all the time the with the teleconverter on there so oh, I'm so actually even, yeah yeah, yeah so you're even getting tighter yeah so um, I mean let me see if I can uh, share an image here and I'm going to throw another question while you're thinking about that which is what is the front diameter of your of of that 400 millimeter lens. Do you, do you know offhand? Seven, seven. Have you tried uh, the close-up lens on the 400 or have you shot with the, the uh, close-up lens on the 400? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, having uh, the, the true uh, macro lens and um, I, I typically try to set up one way, you know, at a time and not, like I said, I, I utilized it, but um, I found that the image was um, 
a little bit soft, but I, what I realized later was that because I was using it with the 1.4 teleconverter on there, it was uh, too much. And I, I learned later, but then by that point I had started utilizing it on the uh, 90 millimeter. And so I never really went back to uh, <laughs> uh, trying it on the 100 to 400. Like I said, I just, I found uh, a way that I just, I loved using it and having limited time this year, last year, I had a lot more time to be out in the field this year. COVID uh, just, you know, really changed. Feels like you, uh, feels like you need a <laughs> Yeah, so I <laughs> didn't have as much time to spend in the field. And so with, with limited time there, um, I didn't want to spend too much time experimenting with things that I wasn't sure about. I wanted to focus on things that I was sure about. And, and like I said, I knew that I loved how it looked. Uh, the pictures that I was getting, uh, those in-flight macro shots that kind of became my big new thing for this summer. And so uh, utilizing like like that is how I primarily used it. Great. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions uh, coming in. Uh, it, you know, now is your chance. Ask, ask now or uh, looks like Glenn, you going to come on? Yeah, I have a question. Thank you so much, by the way. I really appreciate this. And I love following your Instagram photos. Absolutely. Um, I'm doing a little bit of macro, not, not true macro. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe this past two years ago, I'm working with entomology at Mississippi State. But, and I've really gotten the love for the photography side of things. But my question is, so I'm starting off, I'm still a beginner, so I don't know everything. I have a 75 to 300 and I have a secondary lens. Mm -hmm. And I want to, I'm going to explore that Nissi close-up kit and also that teleconverter setup that you're talking about. And then, because I, I did at one point get a macro 100 millimeter, mm -hmm. but I don't think I knew how to use it. So I kind of got, I sent it back. Mm -hmm. um, I figured I'll get some more experience under my belt first. But so of the two, so just starting off, which Nissi, because you mentioned two of the different kits, which one would you well, recommend? It depends. It depends on it depends on the uh, dia front diameter of your uh, lens. Would probably guide you towards the one that you should get. However, you know, as uh, as Jose pointed out, the two uh, filters do have slightly different optical characteristics. But I would I would presume when you told me what you've got that. Um, you're probably better with the 58 millimeter version. That'll fit your lens a little bit, a little bit more um, closely. It won't be awkward in terms of the, the, uh, how it looks and how it mounts and what adapters you need. Chances are the 58 will fit your lens right out of the box with the included rings. But um, if at some point you need a little more information on that, you're always free to give it to, to contact us. If you go to the NISI uh, site, we can't. There's a contact uh, form, and we're not that big a company. I'm going to see every uh, email that comes in. Uh, my um, coworker Roger and I, you know, we we're that's it. That we're we're the company in the United States, so you'll get personal attention there. Yeah. Perfect. And, and the very I, last thing was with the teleconverter kits, um, would I be able to stack both of those that Nissi with the teleconverter as well, or probably one or the other? So the teleconverter only works with certain lenses. It's a Sony specific uh, teleconverter mm -hmm. and it only, it only works with certain Sony lenses. In fact, it doesn't even work with all, all Sony lenses. Um, you would have to probably check with the uh, manufacturer of your, camera to see if they make a teleconverter uh, that you can use on. Oh, there, are, there, are, there, are, univer there are universal teleconverters, absolutely. Oh, um, okay. There's the, uh, uh, Kenco makes them, Tokina makes them, uh, you can find them, you, you know, but they really do kind of compromise the quality. The matched multiplier, like the one that uh, Jose has with his uh, Sony rig, there's really no compromise in quality. A, uh, a generic teleconverter can be a, a little bit of a compromise, but it does effectively, you have a lens, let's say you have a, a 70 to 300 millimeter lens and the closest focus point is say one foot. I'm being arbitrary, one foot. 
you put the teleconverter on there and it doubles. Now you're still at one foot, but it's as if you're six inches away because you've got that back magnification from the teleconverter. So it's there, but I don't even know what I'm talking about because I should just tell you, just get the Nisi. The Nisi is all you need. All you need is the Nisi. I, I will tell you, yeah, exactly. I, I can tell you, I've done a previous, uh, it wasn't a webinar, it was there's uh, a, a girl that does uh, a Zoom meetup uh, weekly uh, on Instagram. And uh, well, it's, uh, she promotes it on Instagram anyway, and I know her via Instagram. So she had invited me to do a presentation back in July. And that's actually when I started my relationship with uh, Nisi. I contacted them about uh, wanting to promote this lens that I've been using for several months and, and see if we could uh, start a relationship. And so anyway, on, on there, um, I, there was quite a few people that purchased the 58 millimeter for uh, a, a 70 to 300 type lens. Usually the 70 to 300s are gonna be the, the smaller diameter. And so the 58, like Jim is saying, is gonna fit it a little bit better. And I know that I, I follow some of the people that, that have utilized it and they've been absolutely thrilled with the results. I've been really impressed with the images that they're taking with it. So um, even though um, it's not the way that I, uh, use it. I know that the images that I'm seeing that people are producing with it are just amazing. And the, the best thing about it is that it's, it's under a hundred bucks. So you get, um, the, the quality, uh, that you would have with a 500 to thousand dollar macro lens, um, uh, by just spending less than hundred bucks. And if you end up not using it that much, you still always have that as an option, but you've got your 70 to 300 as well. That, that if, if that's how you tend to shoot more often, then you're, you're not really out all that much. But like I said, you at least occasionally have that option to be able to, uh, to throw that on there and get true macro one to one. And matter of fact, if you, uh, it's got a certain sweet spot where it's one to one and you can, you can adjust that by adjusting your, uh, uh, your focal length on your telephoto lens and increase or decrease that, uh, that magnification. Yeah, by zooming in and out, you'll change the uh, magnification ratio. Okay. And just Hi, Jose. One. Thank you. Thank you. Jose, this is Gino. Hi, Gino. One of you guys, I'm sorry, Jim, I was supposed to call you about two weeks ago. I didn't get a chance to. Um, I'm, I'm so mad. Can one of you guys go over how you attach this, the V6 to the, to the lens, the camera itself? I, you know what? That wouldn't really be fair to um, the presentation okay. here right now. Gino, give me a ring. I'll be happy to do it. I'll even be happy to get on a Zoom call with you and show you. Okay, I'll call you next week. It's the same number Jim gave me, I guess, right? It, it, this is Jim, and yes, it will be. Oh, I thought, I thought it was Jim Bryson. I'm sorry. <laughs> The no, other no. gym, that is <laughs> oh, same one. Okay. Uh, 424-824-8327. Four, 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 zero, zero, I'll say it one more time. Yeah, four, I got it. Thanks. Four, okay, cool. Got it. Thanks. I'm going to unmute myself. All right. Thank you. Well, guys, I guess we're going to call. Oh, Mike. Mike. Hi, Mike. Mike, you're on mute. I'm gonna mute, I'm gonna mute you for now. You can unmute yourself, um, but we were getting a little bit of static there. There you go. You with me, Mike? All right. We're yeah, gonna call. Sorry, sorry we're Mike. Gonna call that a day. Really. Uh, maybe you can uh, ask via chat. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, Mike, try asking uh, through chat because uh, you're, you're, uh, <laughs> all right, we're gonna, we're gonna call that, we're gonna call that it. Jose? I can't thank you enough. Uh, it was a great presentation. 
Uh, if you guys, by the way, um, have a desire to see it again, Mr. Magical will be in the b &H photo event space on December 7th. And uh, I believe doing the same or similar presentation, mm -hmm. but uh, I love to watch uh, repeats on TV. So I'll probably be tuning in. You're, you're, I, I, I truly came into this uh, webinar really interested in seeing how you do your work and it's fantastic. Absolutely love it. I'm so glad we worked together, Jose. Absolutely, likewise. All right, so everyone, you've got the discount coupon. I was gonna to mention to Glenn, uh, who I believe was the one asking the question. Here's your chance to get 15% off that $79 close-up lens. Please take advantage of it. Uh, everyone have a safe and happy Thanksgiving. And um, our, look on our, on our Instagram. We have nothing in the pipeline as far as a... Uh, our next webinar right now, but um, we'll be booking some for December. And uh, hopefully you'll be back, Jose, with a post-processing um, webinar sometime maybe in December or, or January. So there we go. I'm going to say good night and I'm going to end it. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.